In the bulletin today, I put this little message. Ed, Ed got such a kick out of it. It's a little box here. I'll just hold it up. You don't have to zoom or anything. It's just a little box right here. And in the box, it says, I can do all things through a Bible verse taken out of context. That's not what the scripture says, is it? I can do all things through a Bible verse taken out of context. It, why would we talk about this? Why would we have a sermon called Taken Out of Context? Well, just look around you. Listen to the news. Read a newspaper. You can take a snippet. You know, we, we've actually joked around about this. Uh, Rick and Ed and I do a, an internet radio program. And I've said to Rick, I said, you know, I can cut that and I can make you say just about anything I want you to say through editing. You can take words and mix them up. And if you're really good at editing, you can make it sound, you can make a sentence sound seamless. And you can take it completely out of context. Or I can cut something that he said exactly how he said it, but not get the beginning of it or what he said afterward. And just pull out a sentence and let you see it and take it out of context. And that affects not only our understanding, but it will affect my opinion of whoever I'm hearing. Or if I read something in the Bible, it will affect my opinion of the God that I worship if I misunderstand something out of context, if I read it out of context. So what can I do? Let me give you an example of taking something out of context and showing you what is done today, not only with the news media, not only with watching it on TV, but with sermons and with people who have preachers and pastors who have done research and they'll apply things. Take a look at this verse on the PowerPoint. In 1 Samuel 31, 4, Saul took a sword and fell on it. Saul took a sword and fell on it. Well, look at this verse. Let's couple them. Luke 10, 37. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Taken out of context. So what's that telling you? But you see, this happens on a regular basis. People do this and they, I don't know if they just don't realize it or if there, some of them do it accidentally. I believe that but there are some people who contort and twist things to their liking. We're told that in the last days, this is what would be done. So reading and studying, building a doctrine upon what the Word of God says within the context. You see, we don't build doctrines. They're all right here. We don't build them. But unfortunately, there are doctrines that are built there are doctrines that are designed, and we here at this ministry have taken pains to deconstruct those built doctrines using the Word of God. It tears them down, and this builds up. One of those doctrines, just, just to pick one randomly, is the, this understanding of a secret rapture that's become ever-growing, especially in this area of the world here in Virginia. We're kind of on the fringes of the Bible Belt. We're, we're close enough to Washington, D.C. that people would consider us out of the Bible Belt, but we're close enough to the South that we are, we're right there on the fringe. And a lot of people in this area are adopting this secret rapture. So what do we do? We go to the Bible and we see what it says. And we look at the texts that they're using and we read them in their context and we come up with something totally different than the verses that they're pulling out, like these two that we just looked at, and putting them together to come up with a false doctrine. Lots of misunderstandings. You see, lots of interchanging. Another place where a lot of this happens is with the God of the Bible, knowing who God is, knowing who his son is. This is probably one of the biggest, and as far as I'm concerned, one of the most important of all is understanding who we worship. We have to know who we worship in order to please the one that we worship. And so here's another verse that a lot of people take out of context. Let's take a look. <clears throat> Romans 6, 7. For he who has died has been freed from sin, and hundreds, if not 
Thousands of verses like this one are taken out of context and doctrines built upon them. And there are millions of Christians today that look at this verse and they have a certain belief in their mind and they believe a certain thing based on this one verse pulled out of the context of what it's actually saying. And it completely misleads. Here's another one. I and my father are one, John chapter 10, verse 30. You see, understanding this can cause us to think one thing or another, even about the God that we worship. It can change if we're not reading this verse in context. But people will pull that verse out and they'll couple it with this one. John 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And they say, well, see there? Now we've got our little doctrine. And this was done in the fourth century, and they came together, a group of men came together, and they formed a, a doctrine for Christianity that came from Babylon. And so what have we done here in this ministry? We've taken pains to go through all of these texts that we just looked at, and many, many more, and show that these things are not completely understood with the rest of the Bible. We can't always just read one passage and say, well, this is it. It's rock solid. We have to compare it to the rest of the Bible in context. This book is a context of its own from start to finish. And if I pull anything out and there's anything contradictory, it's because I'm not understanding it in the context in which it was written. I have to believe that. If there's a seeming contradiction, it's because I'm not understanding the context of what's being said. So we've taken pains to show things like this, that when you look at certain, and this is being buried, this is being, you know, people are changing history, they're changing the books, they're rewriting things. This is happening in churches, in, in, in history itself. And we look here and we see, we've talked about this before, the two different Greek words that are used for God, one theon and one theos, and I'm not going to get into that, but you see what happens is when we don't know this and we read a verse like John 1.1, 1, 1, it causes confusion, and it causes people to say things like, Jesus is God, because it says in the beginning was a word and the word was with God, right? It's, I mean, we, we get it all confused because in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And it causes confusion. Understanding the context is everything. But when we don't, we come up with this. Our a la carte Christianity. Remember that? Remember the cherry-picked Bible? Well, this is my favorite version. And that's, it's really not a version of the Bible. It's, it's a... It's, it's really, this is a joke, but it's not a joke, is it? This is very serious because this is what people have done. And there are translations of the Bible that have done this very thing, that have removed passages and added things and changed words and changed names and removed names. Why? Because there's an agenda. They're taking it out of context. So having, having laid that foundation... Let's take a look at a couple of things. I want to start by opening your Bible to John chapter 21. This is the Gospel of John. And we're going to spend our time in the book of John, and we're going to work our way backward. We're going to start at the last chapter of the book of John, and we're going to work our way toward the front, toward the beginning of the book of John. <clears throat> so I want you to notice what this says, because this is a passage that understanding the context can change the whole meaning of what we believe, and not only what we believe, but how we understand the passage. What's being said? Why is it being said? So John chapter 21, and I'm going to begin here in verse 15. Now, I've covered this before, and I'm doing this for a particular reason. I've covered this before. John chapter 15, or chapter 21, verse 15. It says, so when they, that's the, the disciples, had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
he said to him, feed my lambs. Now let's stop there for a moment. I want you to look at this text. I want to show it to you on the screen. This is from the New King James Bible. And I've highlighted that word there. I know it's a little small because I have something I want to show you underneath it. It says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Judah, do you love me more than these? Now, just a moment. One of the things that most of us don't understand, I think most of us here do, but a lot of people that may watch this video or see this sermon may not understand is that in English, we have one word for love, and that's love. You've heard me say before, I love my wife. I love studying the Bible. I love my dog. I love driving. I love chocolate ice cream. You see, do they mean different things? I love God. I love Jesus Christ. Now, when I say that to you in English, we all, we have, because of the context in which I'm saying it, you get it. But not knowing the context of love here, we may or may not understand what Jesus was asking Peter. We may not get it. So take a look. There's four words in Greek for love. One is agape, one is storge, one is eros, and one is phileo. We're going to look at agape and phileo today. Eros is, comes from the word erotica, so it means an erotic type of love. Storge is a, is a principled love. It's just a, uh, it's just a love for neighbor as in, well, I'm not going to do that because I don't want them to do that to me. It's, it's a principled love. <clears throat> so we have eros and we have storge. But today we're going to consider phileo and we're going to consider agape, just in this context, okay? So agape, this, this word here, it says the highest form of love, charity, and the love of God for man and man for God. Within Christianity, agape is considered to be the love originating from God or Christ for humankind. What kind of love does God have for you? He gave his son. This is agape love. He gave his son. This is the deepest type of love. There's no love greater in my mind than the love that God, in giving his son, giving agape love to humanity. And we should reciprocate, right? It goes both ways. <clears throat> so this is beautiful. You can read more about agape love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If, in fact, let's just take a moment. I, I wasn't going to do that. But let's just take a moment and let's just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 just to give you a little context so that you can uh, look at this. And <clears throat> if we start in verse 4, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, it says, Love suffers long, that's agape, and is kind. Love does not envy, that's agape. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. So I'm, I'm just going to stop there. Read it on your own sometime. What is love? What is this agape love? How deep does it go? It goes so deep that God gave his son for everyone. It's a beautiful thing. So let's go back to this text, John 21, 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, here it is again. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But in English, there's something lost in the transition here. There's something lost in what's being said. Because what does the second word love mean? Let's take a look. It's phileo. It refers to brotherly love and is most often exhibited in a close friendship. Best friends will display, display this generous and affectionate love for each other as each seeks to make the other happy. This came from a Bible dictionary that I have. I just typed it out. So you, And you can look these words up in a concordance. I urge you to do that. So... Jesus says, Peter, 
Would you give your life for me? Would you die for me? Would you, do you have the same type of love for me that I have for you? Think about that. That's what he's saying. And Peter says, Lord, I love you. I do. I mean it. Love you like a brother. My good old brother Joe. Good old brother Ed, brother Rick. You see, but what happens we get to the point if we develop a relationship where we would die for one another, wouldn't we? We have a love that deep, an agape love. So here, context is everything. I've heard so many sermons given on this particular passage. And you read it and you say, well, why would, why would Jesus say, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, sure, I, yes, I love you. And he says it again, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yeah, I love you. And he says it again, why would he do that? Well, let's go back to our, in our Bibles to John chapter 21. I want you to turn back there with me, and let's read the passage. And now knowing what agape is, the self-sacrificing love, the love that God had as sending his own son for you and I, versus this, well, you know, it's a close friend. I love you like a friend or a brother. John chapter 21, let's start in verse 15. So, and I want to use the Greek word. Okay, I want to use the Greek word there for context. So when they had eaten breakfast, John 21, 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? Would, would, would you die for me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you like a friend. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon Peter, do you love me like a friend? He changed it. He changed it. And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me like a friend? Ah, Peter was grieved. Because Jesus, he knew I wore him down. He's asking me for something that I'm not ready to give him. I just got goosebumps. He's asking him for something that he's not at that time, let me say it that way, ready to give him. He wanted self-sacrificing love. And finally, Jesus says, do you love me like a friend? And what's his answer? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me like a friend? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you like a friend or I phileo you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Then he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. I want you to notice when he, that's Jesus, spoke, signifying by what death he, not Jesus, but Peter, would glorify God. You see what happened? Eventually, Peter died for Christ's name. He agaped him. If we know church history, we learn these things knowing it in the context. Now, I hope for some of you that are listening and have heard this for the first time, this adds some light to how we read this text. Because all of my life, I wondered, why did he ask him three times? You know, repetition for emphasis? I don't know. I, I never got it. And I always heard sermons about that. Well, it was because he denied him three times. Well, I don't know that that was it completely. It could have been. I think that had a part in it, but I think it goes much deeper than that. Well, let's uh, look at another passage of Scripture. Let's turn to John chapter 11. Again, considering the context means everything. Now, this is a bit of reading, but I'm going to take the time to do it because I think we need to do this to understand, once again, the context. John chapter 11, and I'm going to begin in verse 1. It says, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Verse 2, and it was 
That Mary, who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son may be glorified through it. Hear what he's saying. This sickness is not unto death. Now, I can stop there and say, well, we know that Lazarus died, right? If, if, we're, if we're Bible students, we've read through this account. What did he mean when he said this sickness is not unto death? What's he talking about? What does it mean? And, and he, he's, he wants to glorify. It says, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Well, let's keep going. Hopefully I'll remember to come back to verse 4. Remind me if, if I don't. I, I don't have this in my... I don't have any notes, so I'm hoping I remember to come back to verse 4. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. So Jesus knows he's sick. He says, this sickness is not unto death. And he delays. Man's sick. Jesus is delaying. Then in verse 7, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, there, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one who walks in the night if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said after that, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Okay, that triggered me to remember to go back to verse 4. Now Jesus said in verse 4, he said, this sickness is not unto death. But here we have in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. Ooh, seeming contradiction. But you see, Jesus is not talking about the sleep of death before Christ resurrects you to eternal life. He's talking about the the first death, not the second death. In other words, when he says, this sickness is not unto death, he's talking about eternal death, the second death. I want to make that clear. He's talking about eternal death. But here, he says, Lazarus sleeps. You know, until someone has come to that point of second death, all death is asleep. Whether you're righteous or unrighteous, it's asleep. But... At the second death, there is nothing. There's no hope. There's nothing after that. But for those who are in Christ, we sleep in Christ. We're resurrected. We don't experience the second death. So our death is asleep. It's a beautiful thing. And if much of Christianity could just understand that simple little Bible truth, it would dispel so many misconceptions that people have about the God that we worship and about the love that he has for us. But let's continue in this account. So, verse 15, after he says Lazarus is dead in verse 14, Jesus says, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe, nevertheless let us go to him. In other words, what's he saying? It's really, I mean, if you think about it, I'm glad that Lazarus has died. <laughs> it sounds weird, doesn't it? But he wants to glorify his father. Lazarus isn't suffering now. He was suffering when he was sick, but now he's, he's just, he's sleeping the sleep of death. So have you ever said, to, have you ever known someone that was suffering and knowing what we know about death, we say, you know, I'm glad the suffering's over. They're better off now. It's not that you're glad they're not alive. It's just that you're glad that it's, it's through. Over oh, verse 16, Then Thomas, 
who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been dead in the tomb for four days. Now, I just want to make this, because some of you have never heard this before. There's a reason why Jesus delayed. He delayed two days, and then by the time he gets there, Lazarus was in the tomb for four days. Now, Jewish legend, Jewish tradition had it that no one could be resurrected after three days because the flesh begins to decay. And so in their mind, the fact that he had been dead for four days, this was hopeless. They didn't know who they were dealing with, did they? They really didn't. It's sad. They didn't know who was right there with them. They really didn't get it. And sometimes I think that we really don't get it, even now. There are things that we really don't get. But let's continue. He had been in the tomb for four days. And in verse 18, Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Verse 20, Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In other words, it's too late. He's gone. But if you'd have been here, you could have healed him. But he's gone. But she still has faith. She still has faith. Look at the next verse. Verse 22. But even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. That's faith, isn't it? Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. But look at what she says. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she knew that her brother would live again. She just didn't expect him to live again then. So that's why she said, if you'd have been here, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't have died. Verse 25, then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me, shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, when he says that he who lives shall never die, did Martha and Mary, did, are they dead? Yeah, they died nearly 2,000 years ago, 1,900 years ago. He was talking about the second death. They would never die. And he, whoever lives and believes in me, Jesus says, shall never die the second death. That's what that's talking about. Verse 4, John 5, 28 and 29, the two resurrections. Revelation chapter 20, you see? It all comes together if we just think about these things. So let's continue here. In verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And when she had said these things, he went, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, listen carefully here. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Now let's stop. This text here, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled in verse 30. Let's read verse 33 rather. It says, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he, that's Jesus, groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And what do we see in verse 35? Jesus wept. 
Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? See how he loved him? Now, I've heard all of my life, I grew up believing that the reason that Jesus wept was because he was so sad that Lazarus had died. But wait a minute, we just read that he wanted Lazarus to die. He wanted to glorify his father. He wasn't weeping for Lazarus' death. He was weeping for the lack of faith of these people. He was weeping because they didn't realize that he was there to resurrect him. Jesus wasn't weeping because Lazarus was dead. He knew he was there to raise him up. But they didn't understand. So reading this out of context, if I read it and I say, wow, look, see, even the Jews, the Jews said, see how he loved him? They didn't understand, did they? They were taking it out of context. They were taking the whole event out of context. If they would have paid attention to the words that Jesus was saying, they would have known that he's going to raise him up. He's, going to, he's, he's not weeping because Lazarus died. He let him die. He did it on purpose. He wanted him to die to glorify his father. Lazarus got sick and died, left him in the tomb for four days till the flesh started to rot. And what's he do? He calls him out. We don't have to read the rest of that account, but he calls him out. And the bandages come off, and he was the same old Lazarus. It's a beautiful account. Jesus wept not because Lazarus had died, because he was using that as an example to glorify his heavenly Father. He wept because of the lack of faith of the Jews and those surrounding him, and even those who knew Jesus and knew what he could do. They didn't understand because they didn't know the context with which he was there. Let's look at another account. One more. John chapter 5. I told you we were going to work our way backwards in John. I saved this one for last on purpose. John chapter 5. And I, I just, let's just start in verse 1 for context. John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water was made well made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he was, had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. You understand what's happening? He wants to get in, but he can't because he's, he's had this condition. And people keep getting in before him. And Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? You know, I find it interesting. He didn't say there, yes, I want to be made well. Well, I can't get into the water because nobody will let me in. Did he know who he was talking to? Doesn't seem like it. Let's keep going. Jesus, in verse 8, said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. What a beautiful account, just stopping right there. The man thought he had to get into the pool because he was watching everybody else. But if he'd have had his eyes on Jesus the whole time, he wouldn't have been misled by those people getting into the pool. It's a lesson for us. But let's keep going. Verse 10. The Jews therefore said to him, who was, who, who was cured, this man that was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Oh boy, this is bad news for the Lord, at least in the mind of the Jews. Verse 12, then they ask him, who was the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude 
a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. There have been lots of sermons given in this church on sin no more. Let's keep going in verse 15. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So you get the context. He healed the man on the Sabbath, and he told this man, pick up your bed and walk on the Sabbath. And according to the way the Jews were thinking, this is not lawful. That man just broke God's law. That's what they're thinking. So let's keep going. But Jesus answered them in verse 17, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. I save this for last for a reason. Look at that again. The, therefore, verse 18, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath. Let's stop there. Did he break the Sabbath? No. No. He did not break the Sabbath. That was their opinion. But the way it's written, look at what it says. The Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but I just read that verse, I said, wow, Jesus broke the Sabbath. Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Did Jesus make himself equal with God by saying God was his father? Jesus, does Jesus make himself anything? No. He doesn't. And we've looked at text after text after text where we can show these things. You see, in their mind, he broke the Sabbath. In their mind, he was making himself equal with God. So let's look at a text or two. Let's see if I can remember this. Let's take a look at Philippians chapter 2. We're going to come back here to John. Philippians chapter 2. I want to take a look at this just for a moment. And I'm going to start in verse 5. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, please notice, I don't know of any translation. Let's, let's put it this way, any legitimate translation that says equal to God. And in the Greek, it says with equal with God. Is there a difference between being equal with God and equal to God? It, it's a big difference. It's a big difference. Uh, I'm, my wife and I, we're equal one with the other. But there are things that she can do a lot better than I can do. And there are things that I can do better than she can. But we're equal one with the other. But let's continue. Let's read verse 6 again. Who being born in the form of God, or, or I'm sorry, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God, that's the Father, also has highly exalted him and given him, that's Jesus, the name which is above every name. So did Jesus give himself that? Did he make himself this way? Or was he given equality by the Father? The Father gave him equality. The same as he gave Adam and Eve equality with one another. He gave his son equality. And then in verse 10, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
So everything goes back to the Father. Everything originates with the Father. Agape love originates with the Father. He sent his Son. So let's go back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 18. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. No, he did not. He did neither of those. He said God was his Father, but he didn't make himself equal with God, and he did not break the Sabbath day. If he had, we wouldn't be here today. So, taking things out of context, let's just continue a little more in this text because it's so beautiful. Then Jesus answered in verse 19 and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. This was infuriating to those people, let me tell you. It had had to infuriate those Jewish people. Verse 24, Most assuredly I say to you that he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you in verse 25, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and given and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Let's just stop there. It's a beautiful text. It really is. He has given him authority to execute judgment. For as the Father, in verse 26, has life in himself, so has he given the Son to have life in himself as one equal with the Father. But all things come from the Father. Everything originates with the Father, everything. So when I look at a text, and I go back to a text like John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I look at that, how can I say that this is one, or that they are both God? How can I say that? Because I can look at it and I can say, well, wait a minute, as we saw, there were four different Greek words for love, we can look and see there are two different Greek words for God. So knowing things and saying them in context means everything. One Bible translation says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was divine. It takes the confusion out of the text. Being educated, knowing the context, digging a little deeper, takes the confusion out of the text. Reading that context of the love that we read for Peter, from Peter to Jesus, when we read that, takes the confusion out. We need to educate our Bible students. We need to educate people that we're studying with. We don't want to just haphazardly go over this and just go verse to verse to verse to verse and say, now do you get it? Now do you? No, let's slow down and stop and take the time to analyze and read and look at the text, look at the context, read through the verses, see what the words are. See what the writer, the Bible writer, John, in that context of these three places that we looked, are terribly misunderstood. But when we look at it in context, it just, all the impurities come out, and we understand it with how it was written. Yeah, I can do all things, this is what I said in this little box here, I can do all things through a Bible verse taken out of context. I can build any doctrine I want if I choose and pick 
the text that I want to teach someone. And, you know, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. It really is. It's a beautiful thing to uh, know what the Bible says in context and not take it out of context. I'm looking for something because um, this is something that I received from someone during Sabbath school. I got a text, and I just, I just wanted to uh, read this. Um, he says, I love how you guys don't interpret anything in the light of preconceived notions. This came today. You just read the scripture for what it says. I can show that to you. That came during Sabbath school. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, this just goes perfectly with what we're saying about reading in context. We can distort, we can twist, we can maneuver things, we can make the Bible say whatever we want it to say to, to fill our agenda, right? We can do that. There was something else that person sent me, and I can't remember what it was. I wanted to find it for you, and I meant to share it. I, I hope I didn't share it and not uh, mention uh, who shared that with me. I'm sure I didn't. But taking things out of context... It happens in the news. It happens when we're talking to people in general. If I walk in on a conversation that you've been having for a few minutes and I hear just a little portion of it, chances are I'm going to take something out of context. I'm going to misunderstand. I'm going to think, you might say something, I'd say, well, that was offensive. But not knowing the way that you said it, that's why I was offended. So taken out of context, when we study and read the Bible, line upon line, here a little, there a little, we need to take the whole thing, not just what we like or what we want, or what I like to talk about, or the way that I like to spin it. And we try really hard in this ministry to do that, and we take seriously the teaching of these things to others and trying never to read into it something that we can't find somewhere in the Bible. It all has to go together.